I'm starting, please. A very good evening to all our esteemed guests and audience from the Middle East and uh, Indian subcontinent. A very good afternoon to our guests from Europe and Africa. And a very, very good morning to our esteemed guests from North America, from California to be precise, Ms. Huma Abdi. On behalf of Sultan Qaboos University, American Society for Microbiology and Dash to Protect Antibiotics, I warmly welcome you to the International Symposium on, on Artificial Intelligence and us. We are indeed honored to have two luminaries with us, Ms. Huma Abdi and Dr. Ken Masters, who will be delivering uh, cutting edge talks shortly. We are also very honored to have eminent panelists with us, Mr. Sohail Abdi, Dr. Nadia Alwardi, Dr. Javed Khan, Dr. Elias, Dr. Adari, Ms. Abab Fatma, and Dr. Zayam Al Jabri, of course, is also the joint organizing secretary of this symposium. Uh, warm welcome to all of you. This is a diverse group of people which has gathered together on an academic platform. Usually, such diverse group of people do not meet on an academic platform, more in family and you know friends. And yet, we also have a very diverse audience today. And the reason why we have this is because of the very interesting and versatile tool which was uh, released last year in November, which has made us all very interested and very excited on the one end. And there are many people who are deeply perturbed as well with the goings on and the rapid advancement in large language models and so on. And that is the reason why we felt that we need to meet, we need, we meet, we meet we need to meet diverse people of different expertise. We need audiences to engage with it. We need everyone to engage in this versatile tool, which is going to shape our world very rapidly into something very exciting. And as I said, some people have some uh, other thoughts about it. So it was chat GPT, which woke us all up. And as I said, that most, most people are so terribly excited about it. And it's something which is going to reshape our world very soon, large language models like ChatGPT4. Having said that, it's still in the infancy. And uh, when I say that, there are some people who say it's just a stochastic parrot. Some people have foreboding, deeper foreboding. They say it may be a shagger. It looks like a nice little thing, but it may have a deeper, darker underbelly. Teething problems continue. It has the potential to hallucinate, tell fibs, create a reality which may not really be there. And yet it is advancing so rapidly. The breakneck speed at which artificial intelligence is growing is absolutely awesome. And it is developing emergent behavior, which is something which really human beings may not be able to compete with. Uh, last I heard, it had learned Bengali, even though it had not been trained on Bengali. So that's very interesting, uh, the goings on. Like all children, we need to train them in so many things. It has issues with bias. We need to be careful with surveillance as well as discrimination. So a, a lot of thought and consideration has to be given to alignment. And when I you know, just thought about this and the way we were pointing fingers at an artificial intelligence, I keep wondering where are we? We sentient beings, are we not biased and are we not discriminatory? So I think we need to align our own uh, principles in a more appropriate human uh, manner. Having said that, AI is creating a revolution in the healthcare industry, a revolution in the education department. And of course, uh, many idealists would love to have this uh, state of art, cutting edge technology reach the most remote parts of the world and remove all the disparity. Having said that, it may not be so simple because the access may not be as easy as it looks. As a microbiologist and uh, all healthcare personnel, we would love AI to create some novel antibiotics which kill the difficult to treat bugs and give a breathing chance to humanity. We believe, I, I, the, that's what I've heard, that sustainable solutions for climate change may be just around the corner with the emergent uh, activity demonstrated by AI. It may eradicate poverty. And really, this is what this is the stuff which Utopia is made of. And what better that we, we can get this kind of, uh, uh, and I think I'm stuck for some reason. I wonder why. I think they want me to talk about Utopia further. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ken, do I stop sharing and start again? Yes, you can try that. Yeah, I wonder why this happens to me every time. Sorry about that. Let me just uh, share once more and I hope it behaves itself. So it tells you that machines 
uh, can, you know, create trouble too. And that's one aspect of it. So just a moment, please. And let me just move to the next one and then I share. So, you know, the, 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 uh, a lot of people, and uh, including me, felt that this is an uber friendly smart new kid on the block and we really, really need to embrace it and just bring it there and change the world. But while we were reading about it, and I think all of us have been reading about it, there's this big concern that are the human race going to be enfeebled with this super smart thing which tells us don't rack your brains at all. And is this going to happen to the masses? And are we going to be empowering a few, a select few? That's a cause for concern. Another concern which I personally, and I think a lot of us do is the advanced weapon systems, which say that there's going to be little collateral damage, but that's something which we'd rather not have. So is this super friendly smart new kid on the block really that friendly or do we need some regulations? But in the short term, I would love the AI to take away the, the, the mundane repetitive activities which we all indulge it and make us less of an automation. I feel we have become automations and give us some leisure, allow us to exercise the creative faculties, write a poem, write a, you know, a story or, or make a drawing. And then we come back and we see, oh my goodness, that's what the uh, AI is doing very well too. And so we have some people who are rather concerned about it, including the Writers Guild in Hollywood. And of course, uh, may I say that a lot of us are doing, are feeling the same thing, including the coding. So a lot of uh, new things, uh, disruptive things may be happening and we need to be concerned about that. Beyond that, are we proceeding towards new feudalism? Are we talking about a lot of money and power in the hands of the few? And is the divide between the haves and the have nots increasing? We know about fake news, we know about the fake, and can it be a threat to democracy? And can it be a threat to us? Can AI be selected as the fittest of all? And then is that the reason why we really need AI regulation and safety? so that we, this particular versatile, fantastic tool doesn't become an existential risk. So the truth lies somewhere in the middle. And I'm so happy that we have experts and panelists who are going to help us navigate these choppy waters. We have Ms. Huma Abdi with us, who's going to be dispelling some of the notions which I have deliberately put there and putting the world right. I welcome Dr. Zaima Al-Jabri, Assistant Head, Microbiology and Immunology, College of Medicine and Health Sciences, to please do the honor. Uh, I uh, would like to thank everyone today for joining us uh, in this uh, symposium, and we are very uh, excited to hear from all of you. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Huma Abdi, who uh, is uh, a very um, well-known expert in the field. She's the general manager and senior director and also AI software products uh, uh, experts in Intel USA. She uh, leads a globally diverse team of engineers and technologists uh, responsible for uh, the delivering world-class uh, intelligence AI software products and also customer solutions where are instrumental in Intel uh, multi-dollar AI revenue. She holds a master's degree in computer science from University of Ma Massachusetts. And she joined uh, Intel as a software engineer and had worked in a variety of engineering, validation, and management roles in the area of uh, compilers, binary translation, AI, and deep learning. Uh, Ms. Sabdi is also the founder of the Women in Machine Learning Group at Intel, and full-time, uh, um, sorry, uh, Intel highest honor and the Intel Achievement Award. And she is uh, an industry champion and an advocate of diversity equity and inclusions in AI and uh, also in uh, women's education and support several such as uh, organizations around the world. She was recently named as uh, honoree of the Tribute at, uh, to Women Award by Silicon Valley, recognized as a woman of influence by the Silicon Valley Business Journal. She recently delivered a talk at Harvard University. So we are very honored to have you uh, with us today, uh, Ms. Abdi. And uh, please, uh, uh, we are happy to hear from you. Could you share well, your- Thank you very much. Yes, why don't I share my screen? But thank you so much, both Dr. Rizwe and Saima for a very warm welcome. I am sharing my screen. 
please let me know who can share host. Okay. All right, so I hope that you guys can see what I'm sharing. Is it coming through? It should, it should, yes. Yes? yes? Okay, let me remove a bunch of windows that popped up. All right, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, and Dr. Rizvi, you touched upon a lot of stuff that I have. You should be in AI if you already are not. Um, all right, so uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, and it's very early morning here and I just got my first cup of tea. So um, thank you for the very nice uh, introduction and warm welcome. And I'm really excited to be here. And I'm gonna talk about, I have about 25 minutes, right? So I wanna set up the alarm for that. Um, and there's a lot to cover. And uh, last night I actually moved maybe 50% of my slides to the backup because there's no way that I can cover. And also I wanna make sure that we have time for Q&A, which is usually the more exciting part. So uh, let's move on. So what I'm going to be talking about is a little bit about my job. Like what is it that I do or what is it the other AI people work on and, and sort of a very quick uh, software stack and hardware that I will show so that you, know, you can get an idea of what do we do, some of the boring stuff. And then of course, um, the interesting part. The second part is uh, AI is everywhere. So what is the uh, positive impact on society, right? There is both limitations, but we should also look at what the phenomenal thing that AI has been doing, right? So how it's been helping others and whatnot. Uh, limitations of AI, that's, that um, has been an area of interest to me for years. So even way before ChatGPT and all this came into uh, business, it was, I was talking about, uh, you know, data bias, historic bias, algorithmic bias, those are, those are the things that, and my team has done quite a few um, projects on that, and I'll share a couple of them in the interest of time, but there's a lot that we do there. Generative AI, uh, that deserves a, a, maybe a slide or two, um, and then um, responsibility AI, the actual uh, solutions that that we have. I'll give you some examples of that. All right, so moving on to that. So before we get into that, I very quickly wanted to get the terminology correct for everybody because these terms are often used interchangeably. So first of all, what is AI, right? What is AI is the program that can, that can exhibit human intelligence, behavior of humans, right? That it here, as it says, it can sense, it can reason, it can act. And now we are actually there, it's showing a lot of that. So that's what AI is in a general, right? A program, a machine that has this, this capability of exhibiting human uh, behavior. Machine learning is a subset of AI. And, and as the name indicates, machine learning, it learns on its own. When you provide it more and more data, it starts learning on its own. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning and it basically goes through multi layers of tr transformation. On the right side, last night I added these uh, terms. You, you can hear, you know, generative AI, large language models, chat GPT. What is it? So generative AI, now this, this inner circle, the deep learning, these are the types of deep learning models. So generative AI, again, the name indicates a lot, right? Generative AI, it generates um, AI. It generates those high quality text images. So in chat GPT, for example, you give it uh, a prompt and then it generates uh, things for you, a story or whatever you like, right? Similarly, so, so now generative AI is a category. Large language model is a type of generative AI. And the difference here is that large language models are trained on massively large amount of data. And that understands and summarizes and generates a new content. So this content is not necessarily just text. It can also be you know, a lot of drawings, a lot of things that, that happen. And chat GPT finally is an example. Uh, it's a, it's a part, part, type of a GPT, generative pre-trained transformer. Transform is the technology that is used here. And this is a type of LLM. 
So the takeaway from there is that these are the terms that people use interchangeably, but essentially AI, and then within AI, there's machine learning. Within machine learning, there is deep learning. And generative AI is a type of deep learning. Uh, large language models are type, type of generative AI. Chat GPT is an example of that. So just, just so that we get these terminologies correct. Now my job. Okay, so it's, it's kind of hard to explain, uh, especially that the 25 minutes I have. So I actually have a video, if you are interested in what exactly, what kind of software, what happens. This video was uh, recorded uh, about a year ago and uh, it has close to 50,000 views. So you can um, actually see, and I talk about uh, in details of what it happens, but I just want to give a glimpse or just wanted to flash this and it's a very simplified view of what we actually do. So you're looking at these uh, different tools, Modin, NumPy, Sim, uh, XGBoost, TensorFlow, PyTorch. These are the tools. These are the tools, the frameworks that AI engineers, uh, machine learning engineers uh, use to create AI solutions, including your chat GPT or whatever it is all of these things, right? So, so my primary responsibility is to provide, optimize these and plus a lot more tools so that our customers can build AI solutions. And one more point I would like to make is that, you know, I've worked um, on different technologies, but AI is a little bit different in, in the sense that you can see it as three layers of software. The topmost layer is the deployment where, uh, application engineers deploy solutions. The middle layer here is where um, the machine learning, deep learning engineers create these models using these, these tools. And the lowest layer is a bunch of libraries which are very, very close to the hardware. And, and they have information details of the hardware and then they re release that. And at the bottom, you can see um, the hardware and hardware is also very specialized for AI. You can have GPUs. So again, in the interest of time, I will move on, but um, it, it's the whole AI system is actually quite uh, complex um, and interesting. And, and my career has never been as interesting and as busy as it is right now, but I love every moment of that. So now AI is everywhere, right? It is transforming everything. And I don't need to tell you, because these are actual, actual examples. In most of these cases, we are working with customers and we are help, helping them in this particular area. So here I am showing you all kinds of different fields, domains where AI is, is really, really helping. helping. And it's making a phenomenal difference in people's lives. And, um, just I think last night I was reading an, uh, an essay by Mark Andreessen, who's the person who created uh, web, web, by web, World Wide Web. He created Mozilla and later on Netscape. And he was, he's very bullish on how good AI technology is. And he was saying, imagine a world where every child, every child will have um, a tutor, personalized tutor who's, who's extremely knowledgeable, extremely patient, extremely compassionate, and it's, it's basically catered towards that person. Each one of us will have our own mentor, our own uh, person who's gonna give us advice. So imagine a world where everybody is, has their personalized thing. And there's so many examples, and, and especially in healthcare, and I, I can share a few as well. So education, healthcare, finance, and of course, this I added, uh, very recently is a generative AI that's changing the world and agriculture, energy. So this foil is essentially showing you how many good things that AI is capable of, has done, and will continue to do. Now, AI has, I hope that my screen is not um, covering this. It says AI has limitations. So I had a bunch of slides here and I actually just decided to show one. Again, 25 minutes doesn't give enough time to, to show all the details, but this foil I had created maybe two years ago and I purposely kept it here because a lot of it is still valid and there are more and more things coming. So when I created this foil, um, 
there was no chat GPT. There, you know, the people were transformers for there, but large language models and all people were not talking about it. So let's start, I'll, I'll maybe share a couple of examples um, so that I can cover the rest of the material. So the first one is uh, uh, one of my favorite examples, actually. It is a ProPublica is a, is a, a very well-known Pulitzer Prize winning uh, publication. And what they did was they, they published something on Compass. Compass uh, is a risk assessment software that was, that is, was being used across United States in, in different uh, courtrooms. And judges would actually use the software to determine who to send to jail to, what the bail amount would be, sentencing and all that. And basically this, the, what ProPublica did was they, they actually uh, verified about 10,000 of these uh, people who were um, in Florida County and to check whether or not there's a term called recidivism, which means how likely it is for them to go back to jail to commit crime. And what they found was, because they followed up afterwards also, what they found was that Blacks were twice as much likely by this tool to say that the, the, they are going to have recidivism, whereas in actual, actual when the findings said it, that was not the case. So this was a historic bias, the data bias that this was trained on something and it said, you know what, this is what the history is showing me and this is what it is, whereas it was completely wrong. Um, so this actually made it stop that tool and, and you know, people to rethink that AI is, is not perfect. It's gonna make mistakes because it is being trained by data. And if the data is wrong, this is gonna happen, right? Um, stop sign, this is again a very old example that I use and, and since then vision has come a long way and this was a University of Berkeley very close to where I am. They put some stickers on a stop sign and to you and me it's like a graffiti, you can still see it's a stop sign but the machine did not recognize the vision model, the self-driving car at that time was like what is this and they wouldn't even stop. So this is another example and many other examples. I will actually touch upon this uh, example as well, the Obermeyer et al. And this is in the health science. So this may be of interest to, to some of you. So what uh, was happening was that um, there are the, again, AI across uh, the uh, United States and the hospital was determining um, how much care should be provided to patients. And it turns out that um, black patients, much sicker black patients were getting the same amount of treatment as the less sick white patient. And this was not deliberate. Nobody was doing anything wrong. It was the AI algorithm. And this is a more than, it's not data. It's actually algorithm. That's why I chose this example. So the reason the algorithm was, was biased is because the the function, the feature that was determining who needs better care was actually the cost, the money that was being spent on these patients. So it said, okay, this much money was spent on this patient, so maybe this patient was sick. Less money was spent, so maybe it's not sick, but that is not the right measure. And so because of that, uh, the, they were determining, okay, less money was spent, so he must not be sick. And, and so the, the patient care was cut into half and fantastic paper and that revealed so many issues with that. Um, so I'll move on, um, except the hiring that is that has always been my favorite example. And this is maybe eight years ago even. Amazon I had started doing, using AI for hiring and it was completely biased against women because the data was showing, uh, the historic data was showing the successful candidates were white men. And so obviously they stopped it, but very recently uh, Meta or Facebook was again using hiring and that was also, so this keeps coming back and forth and that's why I still use it. So as I said, I had, I have a couple more slides which I removed because we don't have time, but we have I, AI has bias and we are not even close to knowing the full impact. Now let's talk about, as I said, generative AI. Right, so the next frontier, everybody's talking about it and, and things are, there's a lot that it is doing. You already, um, I already touched upon how many good things that are coming out of AI, chat GPT and, and in the interest of time, I think you guys 
probably know more than me that how many uses you how you are using uh, chat gpt that basically changed everything um i also want to talk about han miko this is so you know that chat gpt is based on gpt 3.5 but there is gpt 4 that has already been released and han miko is one of the very few places where gpt 4 is being used and this is, uh, you may be familiar with Khan Academy. So Sal, Sal Khan, who's actually look, lives here and I've met him a few times socially as well. So the Khan Academy actually used uh, GPT-4 and, and that is a, it's a, a fantastic tool. If you get a chance to, I think you can just register and do it. And it's actually showing, it's actually helping students. It doesn't give you the answer. It prompts you and says, yeah, that's good. But then, so it, it's actually uh, one of the best use cases that I have seen for uh, GPT. So I wanted to put it here. DALI2, DALI2 stable diffusion, also something that I actually spent a lot of time uh, doing when stable diffusion was released. Uh, especially open source. Uh, but DALI T and uh, DALI 2 and um, Stable Diffusion, they are the tools where you give a prompt and they basically write, uh, they draw whatever you are interested in. So you can basically say, if, you know, flying monkeys on top of a horse and wearing pink flip flops, whatever you want. But as somebody who likes to paint and do stuff, this was a tool that I used a lot. So generative AI, there's a lot that we can say. But um, so in my screen, the, all the headlines are being covered, but um, hopefully you can see it. This means this, what is originally said was debates around generative AI. So um, let's start with these two examples here. So this is a generative AI. I talked about DALI 2 that you give a prompt and it will draw pictures for you. So when uh, this was released a few months ago, what my team did was they used uh, publicly available pictures of me. And this is a while ago, since then it has improved a lot, but they took publicly available pictures of me and within a few hours, they created something where it says who am I with a cat or playing piano or reading a newspaper. And at first I was very impressed. I was like, wow, you guys did this and, and you make my hair look better than it is and you make me look. But the point is that anybody can, not anybody, but anybody who has access to this can very easily create pictures of people doing whatever they want to. And that is obviously a major areas of concern, the deep fake and whatnot. And this was very easy. I mean, one could argue that you can do it with uh, Photoshop, but that still requires skills. Nowadays, these tools are out there and anybody can do that. So, so those are big areas of concern. Um, talking about uh, DALI 2 and the, the, the tools that generate pictures from prompts, this is another one that, that was in headlines not too long ago. So if you give a prompt um, to, I think this was stable diffusion and uh, DALI to both, that you give a prompt and you say, um, older people, show me pictures of happy older people or senior people. And it showed this, and I love the headline, which it says artificial intelligence is dreaming up a very white world. So it's essentially saying the pictures it shows were all these happy people, they were white people. And if you add the word poor, it showed people of color. So it's obviously, you know, discriminating against the rest of the world or rest of the people. And it's showing that the happy people, the happy elder people are white. So then there was bias and so on and so forth. Okay, I need to move on faster. Um, this is uh, uh, Dr. Rizvi mentioned hallucination, which is happening in AI. So, if you don't have uh, the issue with deep, uh, with chat GPT like uh, LLMs is that if it doesn't have the answer, it has capability of making it up. So in this case, this, this lawyer, in a, this is a real case that happened recently with the judge through this saying, the citations you have given, they don't exist. So, so GPT, this, this poor lawyer without, I mean, it's his fault that he should have double checked, but he used chat GPT and it gave him all of these citations and used 
previous cases and turns out that they, none of that exists. So, so it, it was very shameful for him, but it was a lesson learned for everybody that, that you need to double check and all. Uh, below that is this uh, AI image um, that went viral. And, and it was just showing the Pentagon is on fire and whatnot. And in fact, in, in the political campaign, they have already started all kinds of uh, deep fakes and whatnot. And, and so this is a big area of concern there. Uh, on the right side, these two pictures that I'm showing is uh, Sam Altman. Sam Altman, if you don't know, he's the CEO of OpenAI, the generator of uh, uh, GPTs, ChatGPT, DALI. So I actually watched the entire congressional hearing and it was very, very interesting and eye-opening and, and showing how important it is for the regulations and et cetera. And uh, you may also have heard that there are the, there are these eminent AI, the people who are the founders of AI and Joshua Bengio and Jeffrey Hinton and those, they are actually part of this letter, Elon Musk and who not, they have written a letter basically saying, we need to pause at least for six months, the deployment, not the research, the deployment of uh, AI systems that are more powerful than GPT-4. Because GPT-4 is already out. I mean, the genie is already out of the bottle. So this is already out, but, but we need to make sure that now we stop and pause and put all these guardrails around it and figure out what are the legislation regulations around it. So I put this quote here of Professor Stuart Russell from Berkeley. He is a co-author with Peter Norvig of the most um, important book, I would say, AI, the modern approach. So it's, it's everywhere in every university. If you read AI, you would be reading that. So he basically said that when releasing these GPTs, in a sense, we are conducting a huge experiment on the human race with no informed concern whatsoever. So it sent it out. People are trying it. People don't know what, how wrong it can be and, and so on. So there is huge amount of concern. So then what? So uh, I missed, uh, Dr. Masters will probably know a lot more about this, but um, so one thing that I always say that uh, the responsibility AI, this, this area is not actually a, a technical issue. It's actually um, a lot of it is uh, governance of, of this AI. And um, also there's, there's uh, human-centered AI where engineering is only a smart, small part of it. You have, you need those um, lawyers, you need uh, ethicists, you need uh, philosophers, all those, these people have to come together to, to create these governance around AI. So um, I, the, this, this slide was created by Credo AI CEO, uh, Navrina Singh, a friend of mine. She is uh, you know, part of these, she oper operationalizes these, these governance of AI and is in, you know, often in house committee hearings and, and a very capable person. So I told her I need, uh, needed some, uh, some pointers on what is happening around the governance and she created the foil for me and I added some stuff on top of that. So very quickly, there, there are already some existing uh, regulations which are expanding. Uh, G GDPR is one of those. The second uh, column that I have here is showing that all the countries around the world, and, and this is growing, um, are treating AI as one of the top legislators agenda around the world. And the last part here is showing that there are many, many local laws. And I will give you an example of New York City algorithmic hiring law, which went into effect, uh, I believe February 1st of this year. And what it's saying is that if you are using AI as your um, hiring tool, then the onus is on you. You are you are responsible for showing that that a, that this is not uh, biased against any gender, any race. And so, if you are using it, you have a lot of responsibility. If you're audited, then you know your company can shut down, and you can you are stuck with a lot of um, issues. So, 
So this is coming and one of the laws, uh, the Act, EU AI Act that we are kind of excited about and hopefully I, I believe this end of this year, it will, it will be uh, set. So that is one step closer to the first rules on artificial intelligence. And it, it actually is very, very strict on the uses of AI and, and what it's being used and especially the social media and whatnot. It's being used to, you know, the clickbait, they call it recommendation engine. So it's going to put some, some uh, laws in place. All right, um, so I am, I only have three more slides. So I'll try to go faster. Um, so this is a responsible and sustainable AI. Uh, Dr. Rizvi also talked about green AI, which I do have slides, but do not have time. So let's talk about, uh, you know, the other pillars of AI. So there's fairness that it's fair to everybody, right? That's a very important part of it. It should not be catering to one set of demographics or people or gender. It should be for everybody. That's the whole idea of AI. Explainability. So I actually have a slide on this. This is really important and my team has done some really good work here. So I'll, I'll touch upon a slide which talks about that. And what essentially it means is that AI and these solutions are often black box that it made a decision. It made a decision that um, you didn't get a loan, but why? And, and that a lot of these things um, is also for generative AI, right? It, uh, the Bengali, it learned Bengali as uh, Dr. Rizvi said. A lot, of, a lot of like people who created it or, or a lot of people who are using it, engineers at Microsoft, uh, Dr. Uh, Russell mentioned, that when he asked them and they said, we don't have the faintest idea that how it's doing it. So there is when that's where explainability comes into picture because it's really important to, to know why were these decisions made? What were the features? And I'll show you a quick example of that. Privacy, right? So there are people from medical field here and they know how important it is, the data, the, to, to the privacy of patients' data. And so it has to be, and I, I have an example. So I have examples of these two very quick. Um, security, your, you know, the whole system should be uh, secure and f attack free and whatnot. And then green AI is another area that I have given a talk and I'm very, very interested in because it's very, very, very expensive to train these, these billions of parameters models. And so green AI comes into picture and another area of interest to me. So in the interest of time, um, I will quickly touch upon two things and, and then pause. So um, explainable, I mentioned to you that um, sometimes AI is considered as a black box because it's making decisions people don't know, even the developers don't know <laughs> why it did that, right? So this is one of the, the tools that my team uh, released called Intel Explainable AI Tool. And in this case, it's a simplified version where it's showing an input. This is the input of as you can see that to me, it's diversity is really important. And, and so I, when I was interested in responsibly, I maybe three years ago, I actually hired interns and they did such a good job. And then, you know, we got more engineers to do this. So, so the input here is these two input. One is the nurse, one is a doctor, right? So now it goes to CNN. CNNs are the vision convolutional neural network models. And so you gave the pictures and it predicted, uh, first one is a nurse, which is correct. The second one also it said, said is a nurse, where she's a doctor. So then this explainability, this explanation, it basically says that the model was actually looking at the face and the hair to predict nurse uh, or a doctor, which is completely ridiculous, right? But why is it doing that? Because it was, it was given all this data. That's how AI works, right? I wish we had more time to talk about that, but you're given a bunch of data and then it figures out that, okay, these people are doctors. So what, what do they have in common? They have short hair and they look like men or whatever the, the algorithm, the AI determined on its own. But then when this explainable tools, they go in there and they say, no, that's the very wrong thing to be checking. 
So when the unbiased CNNs happen, they are looking at things like stethoscope, uh, which will say that this is a, a doctor. So that's where explainability and those kind of things, because right now there's all these AI models out there and they're learning on their own, they're doing things on their own without checks and balances. However, explainability has become very, very important. Just this morning, um, just before the talk, I was reading something that popped up that Google has released in Vortex AI, Responsible AI. One API, one uh, open AI has their own. So everybody is working in this. I'm obviously not the only one. So, so this is a very, very important field and this is gonna help us tremendously. Um, and the second last slide, or the last slide actually uh, before the conclusion is this one. It's called Federated Learning. And I'm gonna turn it on, then you can see what's happening. So this is also a work that I'm extremely proud of that my team has done. And uh, what is showing is that the data is private, right? So these collaborators that is showing are actually hospitals. And in the hospitals, you do not want the data to leave the premise. And typically when you train a model, uh, the data comes into the model and that's where it's trained. In this case, it's just the opposite. So what is happening is that the data is staying there. The model is actually going to these places. And then as the model is trained with that particular data, the model itself changes, right? The weights, that's how it works. The weight is changing. So then the weight comes into comes in the middle, it then it's changed and then it goes back. So it's just the reverse. The model is going to these collaborators, this hospital premises and not the data. And so this was done with University of Pennsylvania Medical School and there were 71 federations across and just uh, three weeks ago, uh, our tool was accepted by Linux uh, Open Source Foundation. So this is a very, very important area called federated learning. And this is more based on privacy of data. So I have many more examples, but the work that we are doing in this area to make sure that AI is safe. And I will end with that everybody can be part of this. And, and this is my message that AI is for social good. Uh, whether you're working on AI, whether you're in computer science, doesn't matter. You all, every, each one of us is gonna be impacted by AI one way or the other. So you should understand, you should know where it's being used. You should know your rights. You should know um, how you can use it in a responsible way. Um, so again, my message is, and this is a standard message that I give across for my different uh, talks that let's build an AI world, which is including, inclusive, which is fair. And most importantly, in this time, especially with the release of GPTs, it's responsible. Thank you very much. With that, I will end. And I think I did it within my time, so. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Abdi. That was an amazing uh, talk. We enjoyed every slide and every emotion which you carried us with. You know, I'm really happy we see a compassionate, a humane side of corporations through you. While I was reading up, preparing for the symposium, I was getting all worked up, you know, and thinking like, my goodness, these guys are taking us for a big ride and we're going to be just sheep waiting to be led. <laughs> but I love the way you took us and I love the way you simply uh, taking AI forward. And I hope that happens for the, for the better and for the future of a better world, as you said, with AI. I'll just share my screen. So now, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Huma Abdi, for that lovely uh, talk. We'll get back to you again, but we're looking forward to the next uh, session with Dr. Ken Masters. Dr. Zaima, please do the honors. Uh, so next speaker is Dr. Ken Masters. Uh, Dr. Ken is our the um, is an associate professor of medical informatics uh, in the medical education and informatics unit in College of Medicine and Health Sciences, Sultan Qaboos University. Uh, he is an associate editor of three journals, including Medical Teacher and uh, BMC Medical Education. Uh, he has been involved in medical education for more than twenty years. Uh, teaches artificial intelligence and medical informatics ethics at the SQU and has published several papers and AME guides uh, related to these topics. So Dr. Ken, welcome. Uh, and we are very excited to hear your speech. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn off my my video just to save on the on the bandwidth a little. Um, yeah, thank you. And I was um, really pleased with um, Ms. Huma's uh, talk because I, I had the feeling maybe when we were working on our talks, we were actually looking over each other's shoulders because my goodness me, um, the the connection and. I think when you when you watch what I'm saying, um, the rest of you might think I'm sure these two collaborated very very closely on this, but actually no, we had no idea what was going on, and and there's a very strong connection, which I think actually raises the the you know the the important point um, that um, was was made by Dr. Meher is that um, th there are these issues that concern everybody, and no matter how you look at it, um, we we come back to many of the same issues. So let me get uh, started, but I'm going to start with a uh, with a poll. So let me just sh first share my screen. That's my talk ethics and, and AI. And um, I'm going to start with this poll. And I know that some of you are not academics, but I want you to imagine this scenario. Um, a student has submitted. Sorry, I'm having problems here as well. Mira, I think your problems. There we go. All right, so a student has submitted an assignment and um, you suspect that it may have been written by an AI system such as ChatGPT. So is it ethically acceptable to upload the student assignment into an AI checker to check for the student's use of um, AI? So I'm going to just launch this poll. You should see it on your, on your screen um, coming up. So if you see that come up, then please um, answer. And um, I will then uh, deal with the items. Some of you might feel that you don't wish to answer. That's OK, but we will, I'll just wait a few more seconds. OK. So um, I'm going to end the poll there, and I'm going to show you the results. Are you, are you able to, to see the results? Um, and I'll come back to those just now, but we see that 29% said yes, and 63% said yes, but only with the student's consent, and 8% said no. Now, I'm not going to actually um, ask you for your reasoning, but we will come back to this. Uh, it would be a good idea for people to um, remember what the uh, what the uh, percentages were and uh, we can come back to this. So let me just move on. So the thing about AI and and I, and I think this came through in, in um, Masuma's talk also is that of all the areas of AI, one of the areas I think that is the fastest growing as far as interest is concerned is the area of ethics. And I can demonstrate this, I think, with a with a simple example. Um, this is an article that um, I published and on, on on the topic in Medical Teacher, and it went online in March, barely three months ago, and it's already been cited eight times. And if we look at the journal statistics, we see that it's already been viewed more than seven thousand times. So. The timing, I think, of the article, I was I was a bit lucky, but it does show that this is has enormous interest, and people are really interested in this. And the thing is, why is this happening? I think because there's a realization that if we get the ethics of AI wrong, we get everything of AI wrong. Everything stems from there, and it really is as straightforward as that. As you will have seen in the previous talk, there are many ethical issues that uh, we have to confront in AI, and we can't deal with them all in this talk. And uh, the issue of bias was already referred to, and I'm going to come back to that now with similar examples, all right? So I, in fact, um, asked Stable Diffusion um, to create pictures of two doctors and uh, two nurses, and, well, that's what it came up with. So. Um, it tended to get the gender reasonably okay, but yes, as was touched on in the previous talk, it seems that all doctors and all nurses are white, okay? So, um, yeah. 
that's not something that we that we want. However, you can adjust the prompt and I asked it to add diversity. And when we add diversity, then it is a little better. All right? It gets the sampling a, a little bit more balanced. Uh, to be fair, I checked with a few other AI systems and I even without adding the word diversity, uh, there was a better, far better representation. But of course, we want to ask, and this was again a, um, a topic in the in the previous presentation. If AI is so smart, then how do these errors occur? And apart from data bias, we need to understand what is going on and and return again to our friend uh, ChatGPT. And I'm going to switch to. Um, where did I have this? I did have it open. There we go. I asked ChatGPT about ASCIIs, all right? And you, I don't expect you to read this in, in detail, but it starts off with a reasonably good uh, summary of ASCIIs and the benefits, and it's discussing them, and everything is fine. It's got a nice conclusion. And then it comes to the references, and it goes there, and it had a bit of a problem, and it got stuck on Ron Harden's uh, reference, but I asked it to continue. And then it continued and everything was looking okay. I then asked it for a DOI or a URL for each reference and it gave these and these were really nice. Okay. And then I double checked them and I found that there were errors. Now, again, I'm not gonna go through this in, in, in detail, but essentially it made these mistakes, right? It generated stuff that does not exist. And this is the problem. And of course it apologized and all the rest of it. And this is actually really interesting because when I then prompted it further, it did get some of them right. And then as we go down, even though it's got a, um, um, apologies, I then asked, how could you do this? All right. How could you cite and reference a non-existent paper? And then it went through a bit of an explanation that this happens, et cetera. And then I pushed it a little bit further. And I wanted to know, do you understand the significance of citing and referencing properly? Right? And it responded in a really good way. All right. So it's demonstrating that, yes, it understands all the significance. It understands anything. At this stage, I was talking to it a little bit like a like a naughty schoolboy um, and uh, you know, I said, "Do you know what happens to students when they cite non-existing materials?" And it was, you know, reasonably apologetic. And yes, these are the problems. So it understands all of these, but it's making these errors, and that's the issue. Then that we get back to this thing of, you know, why is it making these errors? And this again is the point that was raised by Ms. Huma. It's these hallucinations, right? And the thing about this is that when we see these errors, we think, okay, it's doing this. Is it being intentionally deceptive? And no, it's not being intentionally deceptive. It, it can't deceive because it doesn't have intentions at all. And um, the reason that it doesn't have intentions is the thing is that it's all hallucinations, all right? When we look at this, it's generated from our data. Everything it generates is hallucinations. We actually only call them hallucinations when they do not match our perception of reality. Right? Everything it generates is something that it hasn't understood. Therefore, by definition, it's actually all hallucinations. Right? And this is an, a really important thing to, to, to bear in mind. Because, for instance, if we look at this image that I, I showed earlier on, and when we were concerned about gender and racial balance, and uh, we looked at this image, this is fine, it meets our, our perceptions. But when we zoom in and uh, crop this picture, look at that image, right? My goodness me, all right? We, we can recognize now that something has gone terribly wrong. And, and that's because it doesn't understand, all right? So in, in, in this case, the, the, the text to image system doesn't understand. It doesn't know what a face is. Uh, it's merely recreating something based on data. And it's data that we gave it, that it's using, but it can become distorted, right? 
and that's a really important thing that we that we need to bear in mind. So when we ask this question, you know, if AI is so smart, how do these um, errors occur? Well, this is the problem. It's reflecting us. AI systems are built by humans with human values. When we look at the AI, we're actually looking into a mirror and we see ourselves within that AI, not perfectly, but still recognizable. And the problem is if we look closely and for long enough, there's a danger that we won't be able to tell the difference. This is what we have to bear in mind when we're thinking about the design of AI and the ethics of these designs. And so far, I'm focusing on this discussion of the of the of the design and the ethics in this. All right, and that's where a lot of the uh, discussion internationally happens. How is it designed? How will it harm us? Is the design ethical? But the real problem by extension and, and the possibility for real good is not only in the design, but it's in the ethical usage of AI. And in education, that usage starts with us, the teachers. So in education, there's a lot of argument about students using AI unethically, you know, using it for cheating. But we actually need to look a little deeper into that mirror and look at ourselves. Um, this is a report from an author who wrote a paper. He submitted it to a journal and the reviewers submitted that paper to ChatGPT. ChatGPT generated hallucinated references. And then those reviewers recommended those hallucinated references to the author. All right. And yeah, that's, you know, people, it's the usage. Not only that, journals are now receiving papers from researchers, from established researchers in the field. And it's obvious that these papers have been generated by ChatGPT. And one of the ways that you can spot it is it's got these referencing hallucinations, right? So, you know, while we're worried about AI's ethics, look in the mirror, it's us, right? We cannot be too condemning of something on the other side when in fact it's coming from us and we are using it unethically. So for a, a good starting point then to uh, improve ethics is to actually look at our own ethics. We don't start with the IRBs, we don't start with the ethics committees and the laws, we start with ourselves. Right? And I'm reminded of a, of a poem by uh, Louis Magnice, who uh, a poem called Prayer Before Birth, and he prays for a white light in the back of my mind to guide me. And that's the thing. We have that white light. We need to use it. So I'm going to actually return to um, the poll question. Is it ethically acceptable to uh, upload the student assignment into an AI checker to check for the student's use of AI? And I'm not going to ask people to give their, their reasons. Uh, we can probably raise that in the discussion. But I want to point out a few things. Uh, some of you will have said yes. Some of you said yes only with the student's consent. Some of you said no. So firstly, for those of you who uh, said yes, you need to know that these checkers are notoriously inaccurate, all right? This is a, a, a promising one, GPT is zero, but you can see from the underline, as such, these results should not be used to punish students. They don't trust their own tool, all right? What's the point of actually using it if you can't trust it? Uh, Turnitin, Turnitin has an AI checker. They make similar claims, but they can get very, very vague. You know, they'll, they'll say that, they, um, they are, um, this is what they're aiming for. Our efforts are primarily being on ensuring, right? But then when you get into the numbers, the numbers get a little bit uh, vaguer. And of course, they don't share their data. They don't show us how they actually got to these numbers. Um, secondly, if you're going to be uploading data, you're uploading the data into a third party site. What happens to that information? Have any of you actually tried to read through any of the terms and conditions? You know, so GPT-0, if you've ever used it, it's 6,000 words. Uh, people are going to read through that and you're going to understand that? I don't think so. 
And uh, by the way, um, that in that uh, um, um, terms and conditions, they say that uh, we're not allowed to actually disparage, tarnish, or otherwise harm that site. So we're not allowed to say horrible things about that site. You know, we can't say anything bad about GPT-0. So maybe actually just by doing this presentation, I've got myself into trouble. Who knows? But this is the kind of thing that they put on the sites. Nobody actually reads this. And that is a problem. And then um, thirdly, some of you said that they... Um, they want to hedge their bets. They want the students' consent only. Okay, and this is a problem because in places like ChatGPT, it's hard to find the information. It's hard to find what they are actually doing with this. But when we look at the consent, remember we're not asking for consent. We want informed consent. And again, I return to Ms. Um, Huma. She made it clear. All right, this is informed consent. And this is a really important thing, because if we want to make it informed consent, what exactly are you going to be informing the student? Right? Before that student can give consent, you need to inform the student, what is it that you're going to be informing them about? Do you actually know what these tools are doing? Do you know how they will do it? And if you don't, are you really informing them at all? Or are you just going for a tick on a paper and you're hoping that when the student joins the course or joins the university, that they'll just say, yes, 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 I agree, I agree, I agree, and then you've got that. That's not consent. That's not informed consent, right? Because you've informed them of, of nothing. And so you're breaking an ethical issue right there. And again, it comes back to the fact that we can't moan about AI's ethics when we are beginning to use it unethically. So. We then get to the final answer. And the bad news is, well, you're not gonna get it from me, all right? I'm terribly sorry, you're not gonna get it from me, but it does start with conversations like this and the questions that follow. And so I think this is a good place for me to end. And uh, in case you're interested, yeah, all the images were, uh, apart from the text images, they were all AI generated and these are my, my sources. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken, for that uh, talk once more. I think today has been a very, very instructive and educative for us, very crisp, both Ms. Huma and you, very crisp and yet so enlightening. And I think things are getting slightly clearer from the point of the users. We are the end users. And thank you for giving us that uh, very, very important guidance on that. I'm going to start sharing the screen once more, and I hope it behaves itself. Uh, so, <laughs> I think I'm going to stop and begin again. Sorry about that. We're going into the question answer session now with our eminent uh, panelists. Let me just give me a minute and I'll be uh, showing you that picture. So we've been very fortunate to have some excellent panelists with us. And I thank them for giving us their time and their interest in this very important uh, symposium. So there, there we go. And now it's refusing to slide. It does, okay. So here are our eminent and I will uh, request them to please feel free to ask questions of our two illustrious speakers. I will unmute uh, Mr. Sohail Abdi first and then proceed with the next. Is that fine with everyone? Let me see. You know, it's crazy now, it's not showing me that. Mr. Muhammad, can you unmute Mr. Sohail Abdi from your end? Yes, I'll try. Okay, it is done. Okay, I've done it. Great, great. Yes. I think both the, uh, thank you, Meher. Both the uh, topics were excellent and uh, it opened my mind to so many different questions which occurred as soon as the uh, slides were shown. But I will limit myself to one question to Ms. Huma. Uh, that imagination is one of the most important human traits. 
it can visualize what is not there. Jules Verne, over 150 years ago, wrote about underwater cities, flight to moon, etc. And he was ridiculed at that time. Can AI do it today or tomorrow? I think that's an excellent question. Um, and the short answer would be yes, because AI is actually trained, as you said, on, uh, you talked about Verne's, but it's trained on not just Verne's, other fiction authors, including Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Isaac Asimov. So it can certainly interpolate. It can, or maybe I can even extend it to extrapolate and produce output in their style. So it can definitely come up with interesting scenarios, but it's, it's trained on previous work of people. And so it's coming up with imaginations. Prediction is of the future is hard, whether it's from human or machine. So we, we don't know whether the prediction is gonna be correct or not, but it's certainly uh, via interpolation, you can say that, that it can imagine, it can come up with scenarios. And I actually played a lot with stable diffusion and it's creating amazing scenarios. So that's not an issue. The issue is whether those scenarios make sense, whether or not they will, uh, they will be real. And uh, one very quick example that I can do give is um, Zillow. Zillow, which is the biggest online marketplace for selling uh, and buying houses in the United States. And it had a model which was doing fantastic prediction of houses, prices, and Zillow was so confident that they ended up buying a lot of property. And that was a catastrophic error. They lose billions because they could not foresee COVID. They couldn't see many, many things. And because the model was based on previous historic data, it said, okay, this is what the price is gonna be. And it actually went down huge. So maybe a human realtor would have been a better guide or whatever. So the point is that imagination is not difficult based on whatever it knows, but whether it's correct or not, it's yet to be seen. I hope it answers and we can talk more um, offline. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Nadia, would you like to go ahead? Dr. Nadia, I'd like to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can yes, hear you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meher, and thank you for our two eminent speakers. I really, I'm not an expert on the subject and I've learned a lot today from them. I have a question to Ken. Uh, Ken, you mentioned about the use of, um, um, students' use of um, AI, for example, in um, assignments and all, and, and also um, like the, um, maybe the efforts of the, the school in trying to curb such such um, practices by putting them in, um, you know, like Turnitin or um, other um, uh, platforms that um, show the use of such um, um, artificial intelligence tools. Now, even when we saw uh, that these are not accurate and they can make up these references and they can make up the information, there is no way we can prevent students from using such platforms. How do you think, how do you think that we will progress in the future? How do you think we can enable the use of AI? I mean, allow students use of AI because they are not going to stop using it, right? Uh, how can we allow the students of use of AI, but um, ethically? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and and I'm sure every single university in in the world has two things in common. Uh, the first is they're all asking that question, and the second thing is they don't really know. Right? No one really knows. We're all we're all pretty much guessing in the dark. I think we've got a lot of ideas, and a lot of things have been tried with reasonable degrees of of success, and um, you know. So for instance, one of the things that, that you can do is you can set a question 
and then you can generate um, a response from from ChatGPT, and then you can use that in the class, and you can ask students to critique that and to look at that and to and to give answers about you know what what do they think of that? Do they think the argument is valid, and if not, why not, etc. Um, those are the sorts of things. Um, some people have um, actually used ChatGPT in their classes, and so they require their students to to register, and that can be really, really good. But that in itself um, has a major ethical problem because when people register into ChatGPT, they have to give their personal details. Now, so that means that as a requirement for my course, my students have to give their personal details into a third party system. I have no control over what's going on there. I don't know what is being done with that. And of course, it's going to be used for, for advertising and spamming and things like that. Plus, then every time that student uses that system for anything else, it's gathering that data. So uh, that's a that's a good possibility, but that has to be managed very, very carefully. Um, I think whatever happens, firstly, staff have to bring themselves up to speed very, very quickly with what is going on and with what can be done. Uh, secondly, we do need to guide teachers and we guide we can only guide them if we actually have that it, i mean we we need to uh, we need to guide our, our students but we can only guide them if we know that information our, ourselves um as a as a starting point we can make it clear that students can use the system but they need to declare exactly how they have used it so if a student decides for instance that they've typed up something and then they want ChatGPT to fix up the language uh, tone it down a little bit make it more simple that kind of thing should be perfectly acceptable but the student should simply declare exactly how they've used it and then the student ca carries full responsibility so if something has been written and it's rubbish the student can't say oh well it's not my fault because this is what ChatGPT said um, the student carries full responsibility for it. So it's it's really broad, but that that is some some idea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadia, for that excellent question, and Dr. Ken for explaining it so well. Dr. Javed Khan is us because his flight had some you know the issues with the change in time. So he sent the question to Ms. Hum, which I think is an excellent question coming from uh, in the in, in the domain of LMICs. So he's saying what could be done in the regulatory arena, especially of developing countries to forestall the issues which, you know, the ethical issues which are coming in because the guardrails in the West are very much in place. The, the LMICs, for example, India is running to get catch hold of that. What are we, do you think uh, the guardrails are in place in LMICs as well? Do you have any idea about that? The guardrails and in general, let me give a gen, sort of a general uh, answer that anything to do with legislative regulatory is extremely, extremely difficult. So whether it's uh, the West or so, or, or uh, developing countries, it's, it's extremely difficult to do that. So any, any usage of AI, as I mentioned that uh, the closest that we have is the EU AI, anything related to AI, that is the closest that we have had. Um, but how to implement is yet another issue, especially in developing countries. And what are the consequences of, of somebody using? So I, my general answer would be that um, the short answer to whether or not how e easy it is to have rules um, or uh, for evolution of AI in general is extremely, extremely difficult. This is one of the biggest challenges that we have. And in fact, I think, uh, Dr. Masters is probably better at answering this question than, than myself because I am, I am an engineer, I'm on the engineering side. I know a little because I have customers, but I think he might probably have a better answer than I do. All I can say is it's, it's extremely difficult, especially if it has to be done in a democratic way, the process is slow, uh, AI is growing at an exponential rate, so it's very hard. Yeah, really, that's, an, that's a huge concern. And people talk about bad characters, this thing getting into the hands of bad characters is something and uh, we need to be concerned about and the populist governments. So anyway, elections are coming in India, elections are coming in the USA and we need to be very, very careful. Thank you for that excellent answer. In the interest of time, Dr. Ken, I'll come back to you later. Dr. Elias, uh, would you uh, like to ask some question?
Can you unmute yourself? Let me just see. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you both uh, for the nice talks. Uh, we're really like indeed. Actually, I had two questions. One of them was asked partially, so about how quickly can we actually match with the evolution of the AI in terms of uh, rules? And also the fact that ethics are not all the same in all countries and are not all the same with time. So uh, what is ethical now might not be ethical later, vice versa. The other question is to what degree AI in the future can have humanized way of thinking like in emotional thinking creative thinking uh critical thinking and creativity thank you very much Okay, well, if I can tackle the, the um, ethical side um, briefly, you're absolutely right. Firstly, I, I don't think that there's anything that the 8 billion people on this planet would agree to have that is ethical because everybody will have a different idea and, and you know, um, you can look at any, any major issue and, and their differences. But you're quite right that it will also evolve. But not only that, one of the, one of the issues that, that if you think of is that um, most of our ethics is, behave, is is focused on our behavior and we develop it out of our intelligence, out of our reason and things like that. And well, if it's developed from intelligence and from reason and AI is becoming more intelligent and better at reasoning, then there may come a time when it actually comes up with a far better ethical model than than we've got. And 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 of course, that's that's one of the things that that if it's taken to the extreme, it's one of the people, uh, one of the things that people are worried about. They're saying, what if AI looks at the world and says, actually, the best way to solve most of the world's problems like wars and pollution is to get rid of humans? Um, you know, so you know, is that an ethical um response? Uh, yeah, that is a that is a very very difficult thing, and yeah, the, 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 that will only play out in the next twenty years. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about. Uh, I think he mentioned about critical thinking, creativity. To what degree uh, that can do? So, um, so AI is basically based on mathematical techniques solving problems, right? Are in are machines intelligent? Uh, do they have emotions? Um, so this question was asked 70 years ago by Turing. And um, not like a philosoph philosophical question, this was a practical thing that he did. Uh, so the Turing test that was proposed, as I mentioned about 70 years ago, was to determine the machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior like a human. So the test that, that he had proposed was there would be a human evaluator and he's engaging in conversation with a human as well as a machine through a text interface and aiming to determine which one is a machine. If the machine success, is successful in convincing the evaluator that's human, then it's considered to have passed the test. Today, it will definitely pass the test. So it is showing, it is showing that uh, machines can show these critical thinking uh, emotional thinking, those kind of things, again, based on mathematics, based on past data. But the, the thing that is bothering a lot of eminent AI researchers is that now it's showing signs of reasoning. You ask it to explain a joke and it actually does. So this chat GPT has changed the game, you know, absolutely. So it's showing that, but I mean, it doesn't mean I'm not, I'm just, I'm not trying to say here that machines are same as humans. I'm saying that it can at least pretend to be, or at least seem to be. Um, and, and they're not necessarily, you know, they have, uh, how do I say that, that they're focusing on human uh, conversation rather than gen genuine understanding. So what I feel is that the pain that I feel if I uh, stub my toe, that's not what machine feels. The pain of losing somebody or whatever, those are human emotions. And so I feel that machines cannot ever feel that, but they can pretend to. So the short answer is that, yes, if it passes Turing tests, it's actually pretty close to showing that as or pretending to be. And Dr. Masters, please feel free to add on to that. Yes, absolutely. No, um, 
Spot on. And you know what, what? What has tended to happen is that as it's um, mimicked humans better, people have saying, oh, "Okay, but then then we have to change what the Turing test says," and and they, and, they, and they keep on adjusting it because they're running away from from the yes. obvious answer. Yes, it is actually close to us. Um, and you know, I I actually had an argument with with GPT for for yesterday about an issue. And what was interesting was that when it was arguing back, it, these were reasoned arguments. And it wasn't just sort of sprouting stuff. It was actually looking at what I'd said and it, and, and was saying, yes, but there's a historical context behind that. And it was then explaining what the historical context was to my argument. And I, I thought, this is actually a well-reasoned argument that it is putting forward. Yeah. And I mean, if I were to show you that text, you, there's no ways you would say that that is not a human. That is, that, that is a human. Okay. But uh, but we know it's not. But uh, yeah, it's very scary. Thank you, thank you. The, um, uh, Yuval Hariri said a very interesting thing that you know all humans should go and register themselves as humans in a building, and make sure that the bots are unable to because humans have rights <laughs> and they don't. For example, you know if my intimacy with the AI becomes so good and I stop liking my parents because they're kind of telling me to be do this and do that and the AI says you're a good kid anyway. That, that's my perception, which we'll talk about later. Dr. Adari, uh, please unmute yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. So yeah, um, I enjoyed both uh, talks actually, and we learned a lot from both the eminent speakers. If you will allow me, I have two questions. So one in ethics, one in healthcare. The one in, health, in the ethics, we know that there is no existing ethical framework so far uh, due to the difficulties in, in setting one. And um, this question is to Dr. Ken. Uh, if there is an existing framework, do you think it can predict what AI tools can do in the future, for example? If there was an existing ethical uh, framework, like in 2021, early 2021, do you think uh, that framework would be able to predict generative AI and the power of it uh, as we have we are seeing now at later 2022? Do you think a framework can be fixed, a stable one, or it should be re uh, evolve as the tool is evolving? My other question is. Um, we all know that there are lots of uh, AI tools for healthcare, and there are a couple of them that they are publicly available for, for patients and for the public. So people, whenever they have headache, they can go through these systems, write their symptoms, and it will take them through a process of history taking, and then it will recommend certain uh, actions to do, go to emergency department. These are the differential diagnosis and whatever. And we can see that patients and the public, they trust these tools very much. So now the, the doctor job will be much harder than before because the patient, when he comes to the doctor, he is already preoccupied with the diagnosis. If it is severe diagnosis, a very simple one. Now the doctor needs to correct the already uh, uh, preoccupied diagnosis uh, and replace it with whatever uh, like a reality with, sim with, the, with after diagnosis, after I mean examination and doing full investigation. So. Is there a special training or awareness is needed for the public in this matter, or it should just be lots of uh, tools, patients can use it, public can use it, and uh, let's see how it goes. All right, well, on the, on the ethical issue, yeah, there, um, it is a problem with, with the framework because there is no, as you say, there is no framework and I tested um, GPT 3.5, and then I tested again on, on four. And if you're asking standard questions, it's it's fine, but it gets triggered very, very quickly. And sometimes it gets triggered by words. And so even if you're asking um, a, a perfectly innocent question, a question that you would be able to ask in an academic environment, you use the wrong word and you trigger, you really do trigger it and it just shuts down the conversation it, and and so that's it it won't even say you know um i don't like the way that you've used that word or i think that you that you could probably use a different word it just shuts down the conversation and that is a that is a big problem for any kind of academic discussion you can't have a discussion where somebody just the moment they hear a word um um they get sh sh shut down um 
and what has in fact happened over the last couple of months is that uh, they've built in more and more railings and, 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 and guardrails in order to prevent ChatGPT from doing things that it used to do in the past. But it has sacrificed and it's sacrificed its ability. And many people have, have complained that it's sacrificed its creativity as well, that, that it doesn't go out of bounds so much. It's becoming boring. It's becoming staid. It's becoming predictable. And, and um, yeah, do we want to have it like that? Uh, is the idea then of a general AI too broad? Would, would we would we rather want to say no? We want an AI system, but we want it to be restricted within our our realm. But you know, um, Masuma raised the idea of well, we know that it can be weaponized, so we might be want to working. We, we, we might want to work with something that is nice and restricted and safe and ethical and all, all the rest of it. But what happens if somebody else takes that same model and says, remove all those uh, th things on the, on the outside, then we have a problem. Um, okay, Mizuma, I, I don't know if you, you wish to deal with the other, the, 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 the question on the healthcare, or is that a bit unfair um, for you? Please remind me again, I was so engrossed in listening to you. <laughs> what was the question? I thought it was a very good question. Remind me again real quick. What was the second part of this question? That yes, yes, I remember now. That if the doctors, if people read all this stuff and they think that ChatGPT is the doctor and then they go to the doctor. So that's actually a very, very good question. Because even outside of ChatGPT, there's WebMT, there's all this stuff that people go and they read it and they think that they know it. So one of the key points that uh, we've been making is that AI is only helping, it's only augmenting doctors. And even in radi radiology, where vision has leaps and bounds, it has made so much progress, but it's not replacing a doctor. Ultimately, it's the doctor that sees and says this. So I don't think that's gonna change, but it, you have a very valid point that we need to educate people. We need to, especially as I keep saying, that genie is out of the bottle and people are relying so much on chat GPT. We have to do a lot of, a lot of effort across the board to make sure that people understand this is this is only a tool. This is not replacing a doctor. So, so the concern is very valid. How do we go about educating? This has to be done in a, in a very formal way. But I feel that if we have these um, rules and regulations very, very strict, um, that will have an impact on public as well as the pe people who are creating the model. So right now you will see chat GPT always says, I am not a doctor, I am just this. I'm... And those are the things that were added later on because there was a public uproar or, or this, that. So I think that is one way to do it. People who are releasing the model, they say it multiple times. Any question you ask legal or medicine, medical, it will say, this is what I found. This is uh, how it is. So in order to fix these issues on the, again, I can focus more on the engineering side is that, that when it releases information, it would be really good to show citation and say, I got this information from here because chat GPT is, is basically, or GPT in general is being trained on everything, right? Some of it is correct, some of it is incorrect. At least when you do a Google search, you will say, okay, this is the information. I don't like this site, I, I don't trust this. But here you don't know which one is correct or not. So if there is a way to show the citation or, or you know, things like that, those are, uh, it's a very good question and a very valid question. So I would say that um, it's improving. And one simple step is for chat GPT like tools to say, I am not a doctor. I am only collecting information, blah, blah, blah. Number two is to, to say this information is coming from this reliable source. And number three, these rules, regulations, um, and in general, education to public. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dari. Thank you, Dr. Ken, Ms. Suma, for that lovely answer. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Rabab, are you there? Ms. Rabab Fatma, I need to see if you are muted or not. So we're really enjoying the question answer session, definitely. Uh, just a comment um, from esteemed just about just a minute are is we have many esteemed uh, people in the audience so you could please uh, write your questions down and we'd love to hear you yes Raba, please hi uh thank you so much dr Rizvi, and thank you miss abdi and dr ken for those insightful sessions 
Now I'd like to ask Miss Abdi that in one of his final interviews, Stephen Hawking said that one of the biggest threats to humanity is when AI will start to self-design. So how can we prevent AI from spiraling out of control with the proliferation of AI and everyone having access to it? And secondly, as AI becomes more sophisticated, so will cybercrime. So how can we deal with this threat, including that of data poisoning? Thank you. So excellent questions, Rabab. Um, let's start with Stephen Hawking, right? And um, Stephen Hawking is actually very special because Lama Nakman, who's a great friend of mine, a coworker, she was the intel scientist who built Stephen Hawking's communication system. Uh, new speech system and adding more artificial intelligence to it, etc. If you look up, so Lama is a great friend of mine. He's is amazing, amazing scientist, right? So, um, so AI can write AI programs and it'll keep getting better. There's no uh, around that, right? It is, um, and but the danger would come if it takes control. AI alignment, I think um, Dr. Meher Rizvi mentioned about it. It's a major area of research. So, um, for example, uh, talking about alignment in, on Facebook, right? So you tell the tool, it, I mean, whoever uh, is doing the recommendation uh, engine will say, I want maximum number of clicks, but it didn't say how to get it. And as a result, the, the tool kept getting better at it, better at it, and it started showing you the things that you like more and more and more. So number one, it's addictive. Number two, you are just focused on that one. You're only seeing things that that particular view of things. So, so AI alignment, those are huge issues. Uh, we are, by the way, nowhere close to AI taking over control. I, I want to say that. Um, things chat, chat GPT and GPT have actually made us all realize that this is really scary. It is, uh, it, it's scary, but um, it's not that AI is just gonna tomorrow take over control. There's a lot of good news is there's a lot of good people who are working on solving this problem. There's a lot of checks and balances that, that need to be in place. Regulations have to come, but uh, it is an issue, definitely an issue and you raise a good question. Uh, the second question that you had was about the fraudulent activities. So I would like to say that AI has actually made a huge difference in fraud detection and cybercrime. It has improved tremendously. For um, every one person doing this malicious activity, there are hundreds of scientists working to stop this problem. And the way science is set up now, that the people are very incentivized. You know, banks are giving, they will give like a million dollar award if you can break this. There are. PhDs, their people are getting tenures, they are, they are respected in AI. So, so would you rather do that or be a you know, criminal? So there is a lot of progress that has already made. I mean, just think about spam, right? I used to get like a mail 50 emails every day that I'm this prince in Africa and I'll give you this, all these spams, it's all gone away. It's all, so these are the good side of AI, right? So spam is almost zero. So in this respect, I would say that AI has actually made a huge, huge impact. So yes, there'll always be somebody who's trying to come up with something. But if you look at uh, the papers, um, I was talking to my son, he also works in, in this, um, you know, creating models and all. He was saying that if you look at uh, the, the papers on uh, deep fake, 90% of the pa papers are how to detect, how to do good with that, right? Less on this. So there's a lot of good work that is happening. I would like to believe that human beings in general are good people, they want to do good. And so um, I think in that area, we've already made a good progress. I think that is a very, very uh, wonderful uh, note which you are continuing to tell us because uh, there is a hysteria about what's going to happen and undoubtedly there are many good people who are working against that one odd person there. Uh, Ms. Zaima, Dr. Zaima, would you like to ask uh, your question and then we start with the panel round. I do, let me just see where Dr. Zaima is and unmute her. For some reason, technology is troubling us. It's good, you know, I feel happy when technology is not working now. <laughs> Zaima, you can unmute yourself now. Uh, 
uh, Zaimo. All right, I think uh, there may be some, yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Mir. Uh, I Sorry, I also was uh, finding it a bit weird. Uh, my connection uh, was lost several times <laughs> throughout the speech. Um, I have one uh, very quick question about uh, the ethics. So Dr. Ken mentioned something about uh, uh, also involving students in the consent uh, or in being informed consent and the difference between consent and informed consent. Uh, do we also have to take into account the level of awareness that our students have regarding the use of these uh, tools? Because I'm sure that our students are ahead of us in terms of technology sometimes, and uh, they find it sometimes also tricky that if you tell them too much or you inform them too much, then again, it becomes uh, an ethical dilemma or to what extent those uh, consents uh, should be taking, taking care of. Because um, uh, some of uh, the issues that we face also during uh, teaching, uh, for example, in different disciplines in medicine, uh, so many students, they use, uh, chat GPT or they use uh, different tools for finding questions. But uh, some of those students also don't know uh, the risk of, uh, uh, you know, or the difficulty of incorporating those uh, questions. So I, I, I don't know to what extent we should be also involving students in informing them regarding the use of this uh, technology uh, in terms of teaching. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head when you, you spoke about the fact that many of them are using it, and, and that's just it. They, they are already using it. Um, they, and it's not entirely dishonestly. They, they see this as a powerful tool. They're using, you know, just as they used anything else. I mean, if you if you consider when you are typing in MS Word and it suggests um, a better word for what you what you've already written, and you you simply click and you select that, uh, you type something in the in the passive and it shows you this could be written, um, you know, uh, better in the active, and you and you click on it and you and you do it. At no stage would you consider that you're being dishonest, right? This is just a tool. And we accept that because we've sort of grown along with it. The students are growing along with this thing called ChatGPT. Um, but, and so if we want guidance, if we want to give them guidance on this, then 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 we have to do it. We can't moan at them and say, you know, that they're, they're, they're just using it in this way, they're using it in that way. Uh, in many cases, some of them are actually coming to us and they're saying, is it okay for me to use chat GPT? And, and, and I'll, my, my, my honest answer is at this stage, our university doesn't have a policy like many other universities in the world. And so the single answer is, I don't know, but I tell them don't cheat. Right. And you've got a vague idea at least of, of what is cheating. But I say to them, if you've written something, and many of our students don't have English as their as their first language, and even people who do have English as their first language, you've you've written something, and you would like to proofread it. You you would like to have someone to, to proofread, and so you put it in, and you say please proofread, and it corrects the mistake. It's what MS Word does, all right. Um, many people when they write um, a journal articles, they make use of language services. That's not considered cheating. In fact, you would be pretty upset if people did not make use of language services. These, these services are actually there. And so there are things that we use and we know that our, that our students will use them when they are professionals, right? So the time to teach them how to use those, those tools is now, all right? But before we can give them guidance, we need to, we need to give ourselves, um, I mean, we, we need to get ourselves up to speed and to make sure that we can guide them. So yes, we, we definitely have to take a, um, a hand in this. We have to be proactive about it. We need to be able to guide them and try deal with many of the difficult issues. We cannot foresee all the circumstances as they arise. And, and in some cases, a student might say, well, can I use it for this? And the answer is, we don't know. We'll have to get back to you, all right? And, and because we're, we're finding our, our, our own ground on this, but yeah. The last thing we want to do is tell them don't use it because we know that's not going to work. You know? 
never has. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great question. I think education itself will have to fundamentally change where we focus more on critical thinking and analysis, more on morality, rather than on what can be easily, you know, picked up because ChatGPT or all LLMs will be doing that. We come to the panel discussion, much awaited panel discussion. And uh, I think the, the thing has come as, so it's, it's, Zayman, just give me a minute and I will, uh, just to tell Mr. Sohail Abdi to be ready for uh, his views. Just a moment. So, Dr. Zaima, will you please introduce? Oh no, this is going crazy. Dr. Zaima, can you see the slide? You can just begin, and then I'm going to. Oops. Uh, yeah, I cannot see the slide, but I. Oh, you can't see the slide. Just a moment, just a moment. This is so, so back yes. again. I'll start. Can you see it now? Yes, I can see it now, uh, Dr. Mir. Thank you. So, um I would like to introduce Mr. Sohail Abdi. He's a consultant with the Center for BUCA Studies, Amity University. Uh, Mr. Sohail Abdi is the research advisor for government of Gujarat, AMA Center of International Trade and editor of Foreign Trade Update. Uh, Mr. Abdi has written over 60 export handbooks, uh, conducts training programs uh, for SMEs to enhance their export uh, competitiveness, and he has worked over 33 years uh, in senior positions at uh, Primal Health Center, Healthcare, uh, SR Oil and Reliance Industries, uh, consulted for organizations such as uh, Crystal and Kohinoor uh, Group. He's an author of the VUCA Learner, uh, Future Proof uh, Your Relevance, uh, and he regularly writes for business and trade media. Uh, Mr. Suhail, um, we would like to hear your uh, views uh, about uh, employment, the impact of AI on employment. Please uh, uh, share us, share with us your views. We would be very happy to hear them. Please unmute yourself, uh, Mr. Abdi. Okay, it's done. Yeah. Yeah, definitely uh, it is going to create havoc in the workplace. And, uh, but it is not going to stop at that because it is going to increase the productivity of organizations. And McKenzie has predicted that 1.2% of GDP rise per year after 2030 due to AI replacing humans and increased innovation. So definitely it is no turning back. And other studies have shown that in US and Europe, about 30 million people may be out of job due to AI. It may be profits of doom talking in such big numbers. We do not know. It is still at a evolutionary stage as uh, Ms. Huma has said. It is, we are still too early to, but at the same time, I would say, like to add that in May of this year, uh, one study, the, the unemployment figures of USA for the first time categorized job losses due to AI. And it said that about 4,000 out of 80,000 jobs losses were due to AI. It may be more because many of the job losses may not be explicitly related to AI, but definitely connected to AI. And this may rise. So ultimately, it will have a very, very disruptive effect on the employment. And everybody must take it that their job may go sometime in future. So they have to protect themselves by keeping AI on the horizon, what is opening, where I can where I am at risk, what I can do, can I do something else? 
So because most of the tweets I see of people who have lost their job, they see they are dismayed. I, 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 I only got promoted six months back. How have I been laid off? So this is a something which you have to accept that it will happen. It may happen to anybody. So we have to now gear up for individuals as well as organizations in continuous learning, in continuously scanning the horizon, we cannot take it easy that just because we have landed a good job, now we can take it easy. Nothing doing like that. And lifelong, you have to have a continuous learning program, both at organization as well as individual levels. And that is the, in US, the, the good thing is that the losses of job losses in US and EU may to some extent help countries like India. In fact, uh, India may be the only country which may gain from these job losses. And uh, because India is the only country by 2030, as a HR study said, a, a very eminent uh, company in HR said that, India will be the only country which will be talent surplus. All other countries will have deficit in talent and that we are seeing already, including China, where the um, adult diapers are selling more than the child diapers, you know. So the aging of uh, the society, as well as the, uh, the, all these factors will create opportunities in India Although BPO, that is the business process services uh, like call center, et cetera, they are already seeing a loss of business because their live chatbot, et cetera, are taking over for the routine inquiries. But this will be compensated by knowledge process outsourcing. Companies already over, I would say, um, by 2025, India will have over 2,500 multinational companies setting up their centers here. And many of them are already doing it. Instead of bringing people to US, they are sending their centers here so that people can do their R&D here and other knowledge uh, uh, processes can be done. So I. The, the very recent uh, study which came out uh, this week said that by 2025, India will have 2 million people working only in knowledge process outsourcing. And as we move further and further into um, AI displacing people, it may affect uh, positively the employment scenario in India. But the job losses and the job gains will not be the same. Job losses are on mundane jobs, the, the, the um, you know, uh, routine jobs. Job gains will be there where you require a lot of brain power, a lot of critical thinking. So definitely uh, that, uh, that change will be there. And those who are in the middle of such disruption, they should see how they can move into more of those kind of jobs which still can uh, are more human oriented and see whether their thank jobs so are much. routine or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very, very elaborate answer. And it, it really is very interesting how the job market is going to play out. Thank you, Mr. Abdi. Our next eminent panelist is Dr. Dr. Nadia Alwardi. She's the head of medical education informatics department, College of Medicine and Health Sciences. We honored indeed to have her here with us. She is Associate Professor of Biochemistry and Medical Education. Then very recently, she was at the helm of affairs of the Examination Committee, College of Medicine and Health Sciences, and has been steering it very, very effectively. Has over, she has over 30 years of experience in teaching medical and biomedical science students, and her special interest is assessment and faculty development. Dr. Nadia, the floor is yours. Uh, please unmute yourself, Dr. Nadia. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meher. 
<clears throat> so I'll briefly talk about the uses of artificial intelligence in education and explore the pros and cons that are associated with its implementation. So we've heard about the potential of AI uses. Now in education, it has the potential to revolutionize education by enhancing learning experiences, by personalizing education, by intelligent uh, tutoring systems, automated grading, and improving administrative tasks. So one significant advantage of AI in education is personalized learning. AI algorithms can analyze vast amount of data, as we have heard, such as student performance and uh, learning styles. Uh, this is to create personalized learning experiences, and this enables the adaptive learning platforms cater for individual needs, thus helping students to grasp concepts as um, actually at their own pace. So AI can provide targeted resources adaptive assessments, and intelligent tutoring, which can foster a deeper understanding of concepts and promote self-directive learning. Another use of AI in education is virtual reality and simulation. Now, virtual reality um, and simulation can, we know that it can create an immersive uh, training environment for medical and other students, which allows them to practice uh, procedures and develop critical skills in a safe uh, learning environment and controlled settings. Um, another use is intelligent tutoring systems. These systems have the uh, potential uh, to actually revolutionize education by offering personalized interactive and adaptive instructions. These systems simulate human tutors and provide students with immediate feedback and uh, targeted guidance and opportunities for active learning. Uh, they have the ability to analyze student data and adapt instruction, which helps them to optimize learning outcomes and address individual uh, knowledge gaps. Uh, we have heard about automated grading, which we are actually even using in our uh, systems. These um, help us to grade essays, quizzes, and assignments quickly and efficiently. And of course, that would allow teachers to focus more on providing feedback and personalized instructions to students. So there are several pros to use of AI in education. So we have enhanced learning experience. We have, um, um, we have improved access and equity. AI can bridge the gap in educational access. So online learning platforms enable students from diverse backgrounds and geographic locations to access quality education. Right. This promotes individual. Um, this promotes actually inclusivity and equal opportunities to all learners. Um, AI can improve efficiency and cost effectiveness, like um, automating administrative tasks, so that freeing up educators' time, routine tasks, for example, such as grading, scheduling, data management. These all can be handled more efficiently allowing teachers to focus more on teaching and building meaningful relationships with students, right? Virtual simulations, online platforms, they reduce the need for physical resources and facilitate remote uh, learning opportunity. However, despite all these advantages or pros, we have some cons of uh, use of AI in education. One of them is lack of human interaction. Right. So one challenge is that and while AI can provide personalized learning experience, it cannot entirely replace human connections and benefits of face to face instructions. Um, now, how many times actually we have learned we have conducted online activities and compared them with face to face. Yes, there are advantages of online activities, but how much do we actually enjoy face to face activities and being with our peers right. So some students actually can miss out on interpersonal skills and mentorship that traditional learning environments offer. So it is essential to strike a balance between technology and human interactions to foster holistic learning. 
Second, data privacy and security. We've already heard about it. We know that AI systems can gather extensive data on students, and it's crucial to protect this information from unauthorized access and from misuse. So safeguards and regulations must be in place to ensure responsible use of student data. We have heard about ethical concerns. Uh, these arise when we implement AI in education. So the algorithms of AI should be designed with fairness and transparency in mind, avoiding biases or discriminatory practices. We have heard of many examples of these practices that um, um, Dr. That um, Ms. Huma and Dr. Ken has showed us. Um, so educators and policy make makers must ensure that AI is used responsibly and in alignment with ethical guidelines. So in conclusion then, while AI has the potential to revolutionize learning and improve outcomes, it should complement but not replace the role of human instructors and mentors. The human, in, um, the human element is vital for providing guidance, for mentorship, and for development of interpersonal skills that are essential in our daily practice. The contribution of AI-driven uh, personalized learning and human interaction can uh, actually create a powerful educational experience for medical students or for any students. Hence the need for a balanced approach that combines the benefit of AI with traditional uh, teaching methods. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadia. Uh, very, very well thought out and discerning uh, pros and cons. Indeed, uh, AI should complement the human beings. We are social animals and we do need the human touch. And Ms. Buthena is here and I'm sure she will uh, maybe add a lot to that but really very very important that the human angle remains thank you so much i'll just uh, quickly uh, share the screen dr zaima please Thank you, Dr. Mihir. So uh, our next panelist is Dr. Elias Said. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, College of Medicine, Health Sciences, SQU. Uh, he got his PhD from the Pasteur Institute and uh, Paris Site University. He did a, a postdoctoral fellowship and continued as a research associate at Montreal University. His research focuses on cytokines and innate immunity, and he has uh, demonstrated mechanisms of innate immune responses to HIV and HCV. His research is widely published and has over 5,000 citations. Uh, he's an associate editor and reviewer for, the, uh, for several scientific uh, journals. So Dr. Elias, uh, welcome. Le, could you please uh, give us your views on the AI and research? Please unmute. Uh, probably muted, yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak again. So I'll speak from my own experience about uh, use of bots um, in uh, research as research tools. Uh, so I'm using ChatGPT and Google Bard. Uh, sometimes I compare them. Uh, I mean, in the beginning, when I first discovered them, uh, their, I mean, their existence as used, it was like when you see your uh, baby when he starts speaking, but then, uh, okay, what can you do more? And uh, actually it provides a very, very nice tool for scientific writing. Uh, for instance, uh, you can imagine now for those who are working in science from the minute you have the idea of writing a review, for instance, in your mind, a title of the review, until you finish writing 17 pages, double interval. Uh, how long does it take uh, without uh, use of uh, an AI? Well, it might take you a month. And actually with AI, I tried it using them. It took me one hour. Now, it's a very good tool to have introductory information, especially if you, for instance, you're writing a grant or uh, writing a review and you don't have uh, knowledge about something, 
and you don't know even where to start to go and look in PubMed or uh, Google about the information in detail. Well, type it there, ask it, take the information it gives you and then go and check it. It will help you a lot. It will save a lot of time in uh, writing uh, introductions, correcting the language as Ken mentioned earlier, and also writing some uh, areas in the class. It can also ass uh, assist in uh, analyzing results. It will not be able to analyze by itself, but it will be able to guide the person to tell what test, for instance, if you are using statistics, what statistical test is appropriate in this situation, what which one is suitable for the situation or not. Uh, sometimes you can use it when you are reviewing uh, manuscripts or journals to double check on techniques that are done you are not familiar with or analysis, statistical analysis. Now the cause of all, of all, for all of these things is that you need to double check. Uh, nothing that is given is, is accurate 100%. When it comes to sophisticated information, scientific information, uh, the number of hallucinations, as you called it, is enormous. Uh, it it's, uh, argues with you even that no, this information is correct 100%. And in reality, it is not. It gives you even false references, as mentioned also by Ken. It is certain that those are correct, and they are not. Uh, so you need to be very careful. And also for scientific writing, there is this technical language we use that is a bit more sophisticated, more rigid, which is not the language of uh, the, the of at least chat GPT and Google Bard. Uh, and they use more of a layperson writing. It's more uh, of right, it looks more like the writings in the very general websites, rather, or Wikipedia, rather than a real scientific uh, review or, or, or article. And it plagiarizes a lot. So if you are writing an introduction or review or whatever, you need to make sure that what has been written as an answer is really something novel. And in many cases, it does not. So you need to rephrase everything. Uh, AI itself can do it for you. Uh, and uh, it can generate uh, a, a good test. So I would say it's a very good assistant. Uh, it, uh, it is the level of a good student who is assisting you. Uh, in writing, in analyzing sometimes, in checking what you have uh, written, but you need to double, double and triple check and not to be misled by what uh, the AI has given you as information. And again, I'm talking about the chatbot, uh, not to be uh, producing a false document like uh, what has had been mentioned earlier by Ms. Huma uh, about the news of the lawyer who have, has based all his uh, defense on uh, AI and it was citing false information. It happens a lot, especially when the information is very sophisticated, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Elias. Dr. Elias is one of our very intrepid researchers and his uh, words carry a lot of weight. And I'm happy that uh, LLMs are unable to replace us, supplant us, and they're still there in the infancy. <laughs> one part of me hopes that they remain there. <laughs> uh, thank you so well, much. The thing, you know what, uh, Dr. Mayor, is I asked this question, this like question to Google uh, board, and it said, yeah, you're right. It cannot replace us for now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so the existential uh, question about us remains, I mean, what are we going to be doing when this little bot, these bots are going to be doing everything for us? Uh, in the interest of time, I'm uh, moving ahead and I think I've got the wrong one. Sorry, just a moment. Can, we, can you see this, please? Uh, Dr. Adari's uh, 
Is it visible? Hey, hey Dr. Riz <clears throat> Rizvi, can I interrupt for just one second? Okay. I really have to go because it's okay. been <laughs> more than yeah, a couple yeah. of hours, yeah. but I really yeah. want to thank everybody. I think it was a really good discussion. I've tried to answer a question on the chat as well. So thank you so much for inviting me. And I, I feel bad that I'm missing um, some of the other panelists. Uh, I'll probably have a recording and I can watch later, but thank you so much for the invite and um, appreciate it very much. You all have a nice thank day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being so accessible and for uh, giving us so much of your time and being so proactive about the whole thing. You've been with me throughout the process and it's been such a lovely experience working with you behind the screens and then listening to you on the screen. We've actually had a fantastic session with you. Thank you so much, Ms. Omabdi, for giving us the time. And maybe we'll call you some other time too. So we're going to get an appointment with you. <laughs> in future sure, as, as I mentioned in the beginning that I have never been busier than ever. So it'll yeah. maybe take a while because my life yeah. is absolutely crazy. It's a Sunday morning and I need to go work. So, yes. all right, uh, I will talk to you guys later, bye. Thank you so much, have a good Thank day. Thank you very much. So uh, we come back. Thank you. That was really, really a wonderful experience with Ms. Huma Abdi. And now we are uh, uh, we're going to be listening to Dr. Adari Al Zabi, who's assistant professor, department. Can you hear me? I mean, is it visible? Or I need yes. to know if it's okay. Thank yes, you. Yes, it's So she is assistant professor, Department of Clinical Anatomy in uh, College of Medicine and Health Sciences. She's the founder of Innovation and AI Applications in Healthcare. And the team has received several grants, most prominently His Majesty's grant for the use of NLP in cancer registry automation. She speaks on AI applications in healthcare, has many book chapters in AI for precision oncology and ethics of medical AI. She is the first Omari to receive the Woman in AI Award by the Global AI team in Dubai. Congratulations, Dr. Adari, we're proud of you. And she will be talking about machine learning applications in healthcare. Dr. Adari, please. Let me see if I have to unmute you. Yes. Yes, Dr. Adari. Yeah. No, back. Okay, let me do it once more. Okay. Uh, so I am unmuted, isn't it? Yes, we can hear you. So uh, nice to have you to, uh, for having me, Dr. Meher, and it was really very fantastic discussion so far. Dr. So what Dari. I will talk about is, uh, you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So we'll talk mainly about uh, the use of machine AI, machine learning in healthcare. And uh, all, uh, all of us, we know that healthcare is a very fertile, fertile field for AI due to many reasons. The first, the, the big reason is till now, a uh, healthcare system all over the world cannot reach the quadruple aim of health, which include patient, improving patient experience, improving population health, reducing costs, and taking care of the team will be the, the care provider will be and the main causes for all uh, not being able to reach the quad quadruple aim of health is the aging population with all the needs that comes with it uh, the increase in incidence and prevalence of non-communicable disease uh, obesity with the long-term care that they need the shift in um, uh, lifestyle choices among population especially the, the young generation and on top of that is the change in patient expectation. And one of the very nice phrases I just read is from Tom Lorry, who is the National Director of AI and Health uh, uh, for Health and Life Science at Microsoft, where he said millennials want to be able to consult their healthcare provider while they are uh, eating their dinner in their home, so th while they are sitting in their couch. While baby boomers, they prefer to meet the doctor like face to face and having one to one consultation. So meeting this expectation of different patients is uh, undoable, actually, with the current increase in uh, healthcare needs. On top of that is the increase and the exponential increase in the healthcare data size uh, due to, for example, previously it was mainly the patient who says the symptoms and then some investigations and examination findings. And now they have wearables, they have the Internet of Things, and they are uh, like lots of data that the, the doctor needs to capture in order to find the diagnosis. All of this has led to like uh, the physician time with the visit with the patient has been minimized up to uh, the, the national statistics, uh, international statistics have shown that almost 33% of the doctor's time is going to face to face uh, like um, uh, communication with the patient and the rest is going to administrative 
uh, tasks and other tasks that are that do, that do not need the uh, physician cognitive uh, presence. And all of this has led to burnout. And again, burnout can lead to diagnostic errors, treatment errors, waste of resources, and whatever. Then the pandemic hit, and it made everything worse. So the burnout increased, the shortage of stuff has increased, the data has increased, and the demand and inequality was more prominent. So there were like lots of questions, can AI help, can technology help? And we can see tele telehealth has been uh, publicly uh, used and all over the world. So uh, then uh, lots of startups has been uh, shown up during the COVID, uh, during COVID and before to show how effective and how good uh, AI tools and machine learning in improving different parts of healthcare, starting from improve, improving the population health to management of healthcare system, to improving the operative uh, task, everyday operative task, uh, and finally to precision medicine. And if you go and search in PubMed, for example, and for AI and precision medicine, you can see how the graph is going very sharply upward, which reflects how much people are working on utilizing AI and machine learning into precision medicine. Uh, because my, my uh, interest is mainly in oncology, for precision oncology, you, if, you, if you follow FDA approval, uh, AI, uh, like FDA approval for AI tools recently, we can see that almost 71 uh, AI tools have been approved for precision oncology, mainly on image-based um, uh, fields like, such as radiology, pathology, and radiation oncology. Uh, in fact, sorry? You want to say something? Go ahead, yes, you have one. Yeah, in fact, in fact, yeah, in fact, FDA have remodified their approval system to uh, uh, like stratify or to classify the uh, whatever medical devices into two types, locked and continuously learning, just to adapt the, the ability of AI tools to learn and le relearn. Uh, locked means that, that medical devices that gives you the output with the similar input that you provide. So it does not change its, its output. But AI tools actually, they, they learn as uh, they get more training data. Uh, and this has been more prominent after the uh, launch of the generative AI, uh, uh, when it shows that it can uh, in, uh, change its, pro its uh, responses uh, with whatever uh, prompt that we give. Since then, there were lots and lots of startups showing up about healthcare uh, use of uh, AI. And there are lots of countries who are investing heavily in healthcare AI related search. And um, it is it is like the majority of um, um, futuristic futuristic medi medical people they are uh, phrasing that AI is moving beyond like it is nice to have it in hospitals to it is becoming an essential tool that we should implement and train our people to deal with it. And even they were thinking uh, about the ethical uh, issues as uh, like something that needs to be uh, implemented immediately and not to wait for whatever uh, stakeholders to meet as, lo uh, as long as we cover the broad line and the, 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 the major issues that needs to be handled like bias, equality, transparency, and so on. So uh, if there is, for example, one of the major issue in the use of AI in, in, in healthcare is who's responsible, who bears responsibility in case of medical error or in case of patient has been diagnosed with a disease and he doesn't have the disease. So, uh, and actually this is a like funny, funny claim by technology people where they, uh, they reply to this uh, ethical issue by I learned it from you. So the machine learned it from human. So the human is responsible for it, it's not the machine. So this is a dilemma and it's still debatable who is legally liable for whatever Absolutely. medical error is happening. Absolutely. Uh, so I want to highlight that there are lots of ethical and legal issues that till now they don't have any framework to, 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 to direct them, and still things are loose here and there. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, but despite all this delay in ethical from framework building, people are growing and like uh, the AI machines and tools are growing very fast and they are already getting the approval, which make us uh, realize that it's here to stay and we should adapt it today or tomorrow. Yes, in fact, absolutely. Yeah, in fact, WHO has, has started ethics and governance uh, artificial intelligence for health course that I encourage everyone to attend and take it. It is around three hours uh, length course. Um, just one last thing, Dr. Amir. The European Union has uh, established a very uh, preliminary uh, ethical uh, framework 
And what I like about it, it is very comprehensive, but they have proposed something very nice. They said for every AI, medical AI tool, they need to have an AI passport. And that passport should have an image of the tool, details about what a training data set has been used, what testing data set, uh, who, uh, who produced it, uh, and all these details to overcome uh, the bias and the transparency issue that it might rise with. So I will end with one, one last message, is the world is changing as we speak. So either we run with it or we just become static and things will move and leave us behind. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you. We're ready to run with it. And while it gets fine-tuned, and it's going to be really a manner for society because, as you said, the doctors are getting burnt out. We have very few doctors left, and the, uh, the line for appointments is so long. We do need something which can help patients at the real time. Thank you so much, Dr. Adari. That was uh, an excellent uh, insight into healthcare and automation. I now uh, welcome Dr. Zaima to please introduce our last panelist. Thank you, Dr. Meher. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Ms. Raba Fatima Rizbi, who is uh, going to be uh, talking about AI in finance. She is an associate consultant in transfer pricing at uh, KMP, uh, KPMG G in Saudi Arabia. She had the uh, advanced diploma in international taxation for uh, the Chartered Institute of Taxation, CIOT. Uh, UK and also international tax affiliate with the CIOT. She has she's also certified management accountant from the Institute of Management Accountants USA. Um, her work entails transfer pricing compliance and advisory projects for multiple clients across different industries. Uh, Ms. Rabab, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ms. Rabab, please. Uh, let me see. Maybe she's muted. So, yeah. So, Ms. Rabab is amongst our young generation people, and we're very happy that she has spent time with us and she is ready to go with her very important comments on uh, finance. But where is Rabab? Uh, hello, see. can you hear me? Ah, yes, we can. Yes, Rabab, please yeah. go ahead. Here. Thank you so much, Dr. Meher and Dr. Zaima. Uh, good evening, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute honor to be here among such esteemed speakers and panelists. Without a doubt, AI has taken over the world by storm. Whether it is Morgan Stanley's open AI powered chatbots to support financial advisors or Bloomberg's generative model, Bloomberg GPT, AI is revolutionizing the dynamic field of finance. When we think of finance, the thought that immediately flashes through our minds is money, huge spreadsheets, and lots of numbers. So some of the implicit benefits of AI in the finance industry include improving operational efficiency, reducing human errors, and automating some routine tasks like data entry, which helps finance professionals to focus on more valuable tasks like strategic management. AI has the power to analyze vast amounts of data and generate meaningful reports, which help stakeholders with, decision, with improved decision-making as it turns the data into actionable insights. I work in transfer pricing, which is a field of tax. Now there are around 200 jurisdictions across the world with each having its own tax legislation. For instance, during the first three months of COVID, Brazil alone made around 3,000 amendments to its tax legislation. So AI has the capability to make sense of rapid developments in tax and generate advisories for tax professionals, which would be extremely daunting to execute manually. With that said, business acumen is something that AI cannot replicate. And Elon Musk has profoundly said that humans are often underrated. So far, AI tools and applications are not able to reproduce human input in the same way with, with the same effect when it comes to strategic management and planning. And in fact, over-dependence on AI can also result in a lack of creative thinking and analysis which could stifle advanced decision-making. Now, AI has this 
issue of inherent bias and the complex financial models that are designed using algorithms are only as unbiased as the data they are trained on. So who do we hold accountable for incorrect or inaccurate financial results due to data bias or flawed algorithms, which could result in massive financial losses, penalties, or damage to corporate reputation? After all, we can't really take machines to court. Artificial intelligence definitely has a promising future in the finance industry, but the widespread deployment and success across different applications within the finance industry remains to be seen. Now, AI may eventually make a lot of routine jobs redundant, but human input will always remain indispensable to propel the finance industry. To conclude, in my opinion, the power of AI can certainly not be undermined, and it is definitely here to stay in the finance industry and in every sector of our lives. However, human intelligence is an elusive ingredient which draws a distinction between machines and the human mind. Thank you so much, and back to you, Dr. Rizvi. Thank you so much, Ms. Rabab, for that very insightful um, uh, thought which you've shared with us regarding finance and bias and uh, the, the implications of uh, bias on the, on the human factor, you know, the, the miseries which can occur because of bias, which remains an important point. And of course, the fact that we need to be in control and I hope we remain, we keep in control and uh, steer the world to a safer and better world. Thank you so much, Ms. Rabab, for that insight. I'll quickly share the screen to our last, but the uh, very important uh, person, that's Ms. Dr. Zaima Al-Jabri. Uh, she is Assistant Head of Microbiology and Immunology, College of Medicine and Health Sciences. She did a PhD from University of Leicester, United Kingdom. Her current projects explore antimicrobial resistance via mechanisms of mobile genetic elements, utilizing modern genomic information integrated with metabolic data to understand the wider aspects of the interactions of bacteria with the human environment, not focusing on selected model strains, but keeping the wider epidemiological picture and other bacterial uh, species in mind. Her very important role is to sum up the symposium, give her valuable concluding remarks and vote of thanks. Dr. Zaima, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Mir, for the very nice introduction. Uh, actually, I'm not the most important, <laughs> the entire panel and also uh, people who attended uh, this session were all amazing. And uh, on behalf of the entire uh, team, I would like to extend a warm thank, uh, thank you for attending also uh, this event. Uh, and we are very thrilled to have you join us. Uh, and we hope that you found this event valuable and informative. Uh, the presence of all of you um, has also made this event uh, special and we are very grateful for your support. Uh, we believe that the insights uh, shared by all of uh, the panelists and also the eminent speakers were very uh, uh, benef very uh, beneficial to the attendees and we're very excited to see those positive uh, uh, impact also uh, questions uh, from all of uh, the uh, attendees. Uh, once again, thank you for taking the time also to attend this event. Uh, I'm uh, sorry that uh, Ms. Huma has to leave, but uh, she um, actually gave us very um, uh, insightful uh, talk about AI in general, the introducing the terminology of AI, uh, machine learning and deep learning also. And she also gave us how that um, actually uh, where the chat GPT was stemming from the generative AI. Uh, so you can generate text and drawings. Uh, also, she showed us uh, the tools that uh, her team optimized in AI also. Uh, softwares and hardwares, uh, and uh, that showed us also how complex this topic is. And uh, of course, we all agree that uh, it is transforming everything in our day, uh, today's life. Uh, of course, AI has limitations, and we all agree that uh, uh, from different uh, examples that uh, Ms. Huma showed us that there is a bias because it's a machine after all, and there is also 
there's always errors or hallucinations and uh, this will keep evolving and probably those uh, will be encountered in the future and um, uh, there are also some big areas of concern that we need to keep in mind uh, possibility of uh, you know how these uh, AIs become also the ethical issues and regulations has to come into place uh, we need also to um, uh, have a, a very uh, clear insights into these existing regulations and also the local laws. And of course, on the top of these, there will be um, expansion of these uh, legislations in the future. And then we had uh, the second uh, part of our presentation uh, on the responsible and sustainable AI, where we have to keep in mind that uh, it has to stay uh, uh, fair, uh, explainability, privacy, also security and uh, green or sustainability. Uh, she also explained that very well. And uh, uh, Dr. Ken Masters also complimented her speech talking about the ethics of AI. Uh, he started that very well, interestingly, with a nice poll where we all uh, participated. Uh, he explained to us how important uh, the ethics are also in different professions, uh, including health professions. And uh, we have to also, he, as he stated in the beginning, if we get ethics right, uh, we get everything right. But if we get the ethics of AI wrong, then we get everything of AI wrong. Uh, and uh, he gave us also a demonstration of one of the examples from stable diffusions and chat GPT on giving all those errors in these citations that we have to keep in mind. And uh, also the uh, all of these uh, uh, assessment tools that we use or uh, like Turnitin, for example, we have to make very, uh, we have to keep an eye on the uh, inaccuracy of uh, their data or sometimes not very clear or vague statements that they have in their um, uh, agreements. Some issues there uh, we have to keep in mind, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the, the breaking the ethical issues that would be also to keep in mind. And the final answer, uh, as he concluded, is that we don't know until now, but we have to start that uh, with conversations with experts and we have to keep exploring. Uh, we had very nice also uh, Q&A session uh, and we covered uh, all aspects of importance of AI in uh, employment, in uh, also the importance of uh, some countries' loss, uh, job loss, and on the other hand, the gains from other countries, like for example, India. Dr. Nadia also gave us a very good insight on the importance of AI in education and how uh, that is going to personalize the experience of learning. And also it will save a lot of uh, uh, wasted skills, like for example, admin tasks that would be covered by AI and uh, the self-directive learning for the students. Uh, then uh, we also had a very um, uh, nice uh, also uh, speech given by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Elias, who also talked to us about importance of AI in research. Uh, he personally also used it for uh, uh, to explore the possibilities of using AI. He uh, informed us that we can use it for, for example, to save time on writing reviews or writing grants on how to also save us a lot of time. But we have to also keep uh, in mind that the uh, very accurate and uh, sophisticated scientific information might not be there. So we have to really be very careful using uh, AI in research. Dr. Adari uh, also gave us a very good um, insight of use of AI in healthcare system. And we need to also meet uh, the uh, exponential expansion of healthcare uh, in different fields, how that, especially after COVID has impacted uh, the uh, the, the uh, uh, performance of employers, for example, the burnout and uh, shortage of staff, that's where the AI can help uh, a lot. Uh, also in oncology and precision medicine, 
And finally, we had Mr. Ms. Rabab, uh, who also informed us uh, about the use of different uh, softwares and AI for advisories for taxes. Of course, that will replace a lot of uh, human tasks. Um, would you like to add anything, Dr. Meher? You are muted, Dr. Muir. Yes, I'm, I'm muted. That was very comprehensive. Thank you, Dr. Zaima, for giving us a very good roundup of uh, what transpired and you know, kind of revised what we had learned before we forget them. I thank uh, everyone, as Dr. Zaima uh, did, I'm just joining her in that, thanking our esteemed uh, speakers, esteemed panelists, and August audience who were there with us throughout this uh, interesting session. We need to have more of these discussions, engage more so that we can uh, tread a path which is safe and yet uh, with, uh, you know, like uh, woven with AI so that our experiences in life become that much more exciting, but safe. So with that, uh, I thank everyone. I think the questions have been answered by uh, Dr. Ms. Huma. Dr. Ken, would you like to say some last words before we go? It's been a very interesting uh, session. Thank you, Dr. Ken. Yes, please. Not really, but thank you very much for organizing this. I think it's been a really great uh, um, session and yeah i look forward to more thank you very much thank you you know just to end i think we need to thank all the human beings who've done all that repetitive mundane work for years on end you know and now of course we have ai just coming and taking it up but hats off to all of them including the coders who've done the ai i think a lot of back breaking and very difficult work which humans have been doing and now we're at the annual of sitting on the shoulders and enjoying hopefully not dumbing down. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rashid, Dr. Nadia, Dr. Elias, and all the wonderful people who attended with us, uh, all the panelists, Dr. Mariam, I can see, um, Dr. Maha al Khaduri, Dr. Dipali, everyone, uh, many, many thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Many thanks to the relatives over here. Thank you so much. I hope you did not get bored and enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you so much.